It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good, good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, uh, this government knows how to spend big on vanity ads and projects that favour their friends, but in fact their fiscal plans are going to see Ontario's deficit triple this year. Across Ontario, meanwhile, people are wondering what they're getting for that money. Rural emergency rooms are closing, northern highways shut down, and schools are running out of buckets to catch the leaks. How can the government justify spending nearly a billion dollars to break a beer store contract that is already set to expire? To reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for the question to the member opposite and through you, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, the, uh, the number that she's uh, putting forward, of course, is a uh, hypothetical number that you can only get to, get this, that you can only get to if you raise taxes and raise wow. fees. Now, Mr. Speaker, which side of the House wants to raise taxes and fees? I would submit it's that side of the House and that side of the House, except for the middle here. And this side of the House wants to cut fees and cut taxes for the people of Ontario and the businesses of Ontario. Now, Mr. Speaker, as, as, uh, as we saw last week, we had a number of uh, businesses say, that this was a good thing. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business, they said Response. speeding up the process to allow more Ontario small retailers to sell beer and wine is a very positive move for entrepreneurs and consumers, Mr. Speaker. What does the member opposite have against Thank you. The supplementary question. And speaker, the government themselves have said it's going to cost at least $225 million to break that contract. So I, uh, but for me, you know, and I think for all of us over here, it's about where that money is being spent, right? The Premier is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to subsidize a private luxury spa in downtown Toronto, while 2.4 million Ontarians can't get a family doctor. He won't pay nurses what they deserve, but he'll pay three times as much to private for-profit nursing temp agencies. And while rural emergency rooms are shutting their doors, he's spending $25 million on partisan ads to gaslight people about how good they have it. And let me tell you, people know it ain't good. The member to withdraw. The parliamentary comment. Or Withdrawn. And, and to conclude her question. So my question to the Premier is, can the Premier let the people know what they have to do to become his priority? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure the member opposite uh, has read the budget, and of course, uh, we all know she voted and her party voted against the budget. But if she had looked at the budget, she would have noticed that health care spending over the last few years has gone from $75 billion to $85 billion, an increase of $10 billion. Now, if you do the math, $10 billion over two years, over $75 billion, that's a significant increase. And where is this money going, Mr. Speaker? It's through this Order. Minister of Health and the whole team on this side. This money is going to build more hospitals and acute care beds across the province, Mr. Speaker. Fundamentally, also, this Minister of Health led the charge to increase the funding for primary care, $600 million, so that there's more patients being taken care of. But she didn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. Response. You know what she did? She put in a request and we're funding $2 billion more for home and community care so we can take big care of people at home. That's what we're doing for the people. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, if, if people have it so great, why are their emergency rooms closing? Yeah. Right? Like, it, it's the Premier's priorities that are completely out of whack with where Ontarians are at. And if he spent some time talking to them instead of for them, he might learn something. I want to take that beer store contract again, for example. Even people who are looking forward to having beer in convenience stores are asking why we would ever fork over as much as a billion dollars to make it happen when the contract is going to expire anyways. They want to know why there's no money to fix the air conditioners in their kids' schools, or but they have hundreds of millions of dollars for that. 
Does the Premier think that this billion dollars is money well spent? Well, as I said, Mr. Speaker, uh, yesterday I'll repeat here in the House, uh, that's those numbers are part of Boondoggle Bonnie's uh, math over there. You know, you can only get there, supported by the math over here, through increasing taxes and fees, which we're not doing on the people of Ontario. We're not going to put the cost through to consumers, and we're going to let the businesses thrive here, Mr. Speaker. Let's uh, continue to look at some of the uh, support here from the Ontario Craft Brewers. These changes are critical to the success of the new system, so craft beer operators have a chance to compete and thrive in Ontario. The grape growers of Ontario, they want to expand their grape growing in Ontario. The convenience industry of Canada, they want to increase the ability to sell beer and wine across the province, Mr. Speaker. One concept that uh, I think the member opposite can't seem to handle is how that we can be fiscally Response. responsible and grow the economy at the same time. This party is getting it done. Supplementary, sorry, new question. New question. Triple again this year, Speaker. I remind the, the minister. Anyways, Speaker, um, back uh, to the premier. In February, we saw the loss of 300 school board positions that support children with special needs in Mississauga in Brampton and in Caledon. Uh, a new report from People for Education found that nearly half of our schools are experiencing a shortage of educational assistance every single day. Students with disabilities have a right to education in safe and supportive classrooms. So my question to the Premier is, why are children in Ontario being shortchanged by this government? The Minister of Education. Speaker, we are firmly committed to the safety and security of those very children, which is why in the most recent budget we increased the staffing and increased the funding for special education. Speaker, to the member opposite, we've now increased spec ed funding to the highest levels in provincial history. It is up over $110 million this year compared to last year. You know, there are 3,500 additional EAs within our schools as a consequence of our Premier and government's investment. We this year launched a new investment to train our staff specifically dealing with a plan of care that co-created by the school and the parent for children that have medical conditions, prevalent medical conditions, a new investment we announced some months ago or put in place. We are committed to the success and safety of children. The funding is there. We'll continue to increase it and the staffing and the training to keep our kids safe in our schools. Supplementary question. People, uh, speaker across the province, are mourning. Uh, they're calling for action in the wake of the very tragic death of Landon Ferris. He was a vulnerable child who died after being left alone at school. That is an unimaginable nightmare for anyone, and I will say any parent in this place, I'm sure. We've been asking about this all week, and nobody out there is satisfied, least of all us, with this government's answers. You don't need to wait for a coroner's inquest to start right now to make sure that kids don't die at school. So my question back to the Premier is, what changes will this government be making today to ensure that no other parent has to go through what Landon's mom, Brenda, is going through right now? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we're dealing with a loss of a child, a tragedy, and I would urge the member opposite to allow an independent, fulsome investigation to get underway and to resist the inclination of trying to exploit this opportunity. Order. Because, Speaker, Order. There, there is an investigation Order. underway, and in order to Order. ensure the integrity of that investigation, we should all stand by it with the assurance that we will work together to protect children within our schools. The school board in Order. question, as required by the province, has a plan of care. They actually have a plan for any child with medical conditions. They are required to implement it. This year, to the member's question of what's new, we added an investment specifically to deal with consistent training of our staff Response. when we're talking about children that have these issues. We've developed training modules and new investments put out this year to help those very children in our schools. Final supplementary.
Speaker, this was a preventable tragedy, right? And uh, this is not about political games. This is about political choices. This is about political Order. choices. Order. The minister hasn't even said Landon's name. He is not a data point. He was a child, and he was Brenda's child. There is a theme here. There is a theme here of a government that is cutting funding and programs that support children. Right? We used to have a children's advocate in this province uh, until this government got rid of it. Families have been coming here to this place for the last six years, warning about the risks and the consequences of this government's choices. So I want to ask the Premier, will he contradict his government and agree, uh, gov his minister, his minister, and agree that you do not need to wait for a coroner's inquest to do right by Landon and other kids like him? Minister of Education. When dealing with a tragedy of a child, the responsibility of government and parliament is to make sure that there is an independent, fulsome investigation, which the coroner of Ontario is leading, supported by the OPP. And that young man, Landon, has every right, deserves this investigation for his family and for his mother. And that's why, to the member's question of what is new, this government stepped up with an investment that took effect this year specifically Order. to deal with the Order. consistent training of our staff with respect to children uh, that require a plan of care. Every school board is required to have that. And Member this for Hamilton year, we Mountain, please come to in order. In addition to the 3,500 EAs and the new funding and the increase in spec ed, this specific year, there's a $250,000 investment to develop training modules, develop the Ontario Fiscal Health and Education Association to ensure consistent application of these policies and the safety of our children. And I would hope the members opposite would allow that investigation to take place without the inclination of trying to exploit it for their own political Order. 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 The next question. Order. The next question, the member for Kiwetna. Speaker, um, this year's Elementary uh, Teachers Federation of Ontario survey reveals high levels of violence in our schools. 77% of their members have experienced violence uh, in the classroom. Speaker, it's uh, worse in the north. The wait lists uh, are up to 24 months to access mental health supports. Some students uh, must travel 48 hours, four to eight hours to access um, service. Will the Premier commit today to addressing the, uh, the student support deficiency in the North? The Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we appreciate the question from the member opposite. We know how important it is to access mental health services, particularly in remote parts of Ontario, for First Nation, Indigenous, and Metis people. We have expanded the rapid response northern school teams, an $800,000 expansion this specific year to assist with respect to connecting access to mental health supports for families and communities, particularly for our children in the most remote parts of Ontario. We have stepped up with an overall investment in mental health because the parliamentary system and the member from Burlington, we've expanded a mental health module developed by Sick Kids and School Mental Health. We also have ensured this culturally responsive um, mental health services for Indigenous peoples. We will continue to work with the member opposite and all members to ensure the safety of those in the most remote parts of Ontario. Supplementary question. Speaker, uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, we are still waiting for to eight hours or not to, to access those services. And, you know, the education in the North is in uh, deep trouble. Teachers working in Kuwaitno, school boards recently told me that the classrooms get evacuated so often because of violence that the students are desensitized. Class sizes and wait lists have, uh, so for support have only increased under this Premier. Will the, will the Premier, will the Minister commit to increasing the per-student funding 
for, for students in the north. Sure. And to reply, the Minister of Northern Development and the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I appreciate the advocacy of the member from Kiwait, and I'm the Minister of Education, and frankly, uh, the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, who collectively have worked with us uh, to build a very effective partnership with Nish Nishinaabe Aski Nation. We recently, Mr. Speaker, committed $2.6 million in funding to support a number of activities to ensure that children in school, especially from the far north, got the mental health supports, get the mental health supports that they need. Part of that funding went to Kuwait Nekoki Mackinac to lead the NAN HOPE pro uh, program that provides community-driven, culturally appropriate services for young people in crisis, Mr. Speaker. Other supports included uh, students who have come from the isolated communities to places like Sioux Lookout and Thunder Bay and ensure, Mr. Speaker, whether it's crisis teams or just partnering with a mentor, they have the resources in those schools for mental health supports. And of course, to the member's question about the immediacy of support, especially for youth in crisis, Mr. Speaker, part of those resources were dedicated to make sure that Anishinaabe Aski Nation as an organization had the vehicles necessary to get to locations to meet students coming from the north or in cities. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, and gosh, Mr. Speaker, you look great today. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, I don't need any political spin. I want a straight answer. And my question is. At a time when inflation and cost of living continue to rise, the federal government has decided to further burden Ontarians and hike the carbon tax by 23 per cent. Time and again, the federal Liberals and their buddies in the Ontario Liberal Party, led by the carbon tax queen herself, Bonnie Crombie, have continued to put failed policies that show a lack of empathy for Ontarians who are struggling with the cost of gas, groceries and heating their homes. Speaker, when the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, was mayor, mayor of Mississauga, she hiked taxes just like her federal buddies are doing now. Exactly. Speaker, Ontarians Question. cannot afford this liberal tax grab. The carbon tax must come to an end. Right. Speaker, with summer quickly approaching, could the Minister of Energy please explain how the carbon tax continues to affect every Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the spin stops here. We are now in full force in our farming season in Ontario. All right. The farmers are out there, and that includes, in my riding, the grape growers, those great wineries like Huff Estates and Rose Hall Run and uh, Sandbanks that we all enjoy. You know, they're out there producing great Prince Edward County wines. And since day one, our government has been focused on bringing costs down. And even in our recent budget, the Minister of Finance cut the wine tax by 6.1 per cent. Great step. We've also focused on cutting energy costs, right. Mr. Speaker, and that's a 10.7 cents a break at the leader, a leader at the pumps, Mr. Speaker. But not only are our farmers out there in the field every, every day, but they need to get their products to market. And the federal carbon tax, the grape growers of Ontario Spons. were with a group of farm organizations not too long ago with the Premier and Agriculture Ministers, and they said they just can't survive the federal carbon tax supported by our provincial Liberals, NDP, and the Green Party, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Minister for his response. The hardworking men and women in my riding at Brampton North and across the province want an immediate end to the carbon tax. Now, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, knew well when she was mayor of Mississauga the cost of the carbon tax, particularly on public safety. The carbon tax costs a police car $6,500 per year for a fire truck, $15,000 per year, Mr. Speaker. And I imagine we haven't done the numbers, but I imagine the carbon tax is pretty pricey for private jets as well. Now, Speaker, all parties in this legislature, including the Ontario Liberals, including the NDP, should be calling on the federal government to abolish this punitive tax. Instead, the opposition NDP, the independent Liberals, led by the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, are choosing to do nothing, and Ontarians deserve better. That's why our government will continue to fight 
Question. This disastrous tax until it is scrapped for good. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing to stand up against the carbon tax and put money back into Ontarians' pockets? <laughs> minister of Energy. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've cut the gas tax, as I mentioned, by 10.7 cents a litre. We're reducing fees, one fare for transit riders right across the GTHA, cut license plate sticker fees, cut the drive clean program that was just a grab. Oh my goodness, it was driving up the price uh, for everyone. Now, we brought in all of these uh, accomplishments and more for the people of Ontario, but the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, and Gang Green here and the NDP, you know, they're in full support of Prime Minister Trudeau's federal carbon tax, which is driving up the cost of everything from the pumps to home heating to groceries that we buy every day. We've taken a different approach, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to build on our clean energy system that we have in Ontario, and as a result, we're seeing multi-billion dollar investments in our province. The 300,000 jobs that left under their watch, 700,000 of them have come back to Ontario. Our economy is thriving. We can do this without a costly carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. This week, Canadians are celebrating the introduction of universal pharmacare. A big part of this commitment includes access to contraception. This will make a huge difference to realizing reproductive health and equity for women, queer, trans, and non-binary people. We can make it easier for people to plan their pregnancies and improve maternal and child health care outcomes. We could eliminate the cost burden for these communities at a time when cost of living is becoming unbearable. But this government is refusing to make this happen. My question is to the Premier. How long will Ontarians have to wait for this Ontario government to commit to universal pharmacare? Thank you, Speaker. Members, please take their seats. Deputy Premier and Minister Pell. Thank you, Speaker. Frankly, we're still trying to figure out when the federal government is going to share their plans. We have been in the pharmacare space in Ontario for many, many decades. The member opposite would know this. We have OHIP Plus, 25 and under individuals who have access to free uh, pharmaceuticals. We have a Seniors Plus program. We have a Trillium drug program plan program. We have ensured that we fill those gaps where we see the need in our community, and we'll continue to do that. I think if the member opposite would like to be of assistance, she could actually talk to her federal NDP and say, why are you supporting a program that has no details and no benefits? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this government has no plan, and they keep passing the buck. But anyways, back to the Premier. This government is playing political games with people's health. They don't care about the health and safety of women, queer, trans, and non-binary people. Just ask them. If they did, they would understand the urgency of bringing no-cost contraceptions to Ontarians. They're ignoring the problem, just like you've done with $10 a day childcare. This government has shown community members, their families, their well-being is not their priority. Ontarians deserve better. So I'm going back to the Premier. When will this government start prioritizing the things that actually matter to Ontarians, stop playing political games, and stop prioritizing beer and wine? Prioritize the people. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Pell. Respectfully, Speaker, that's bunk. <laughs> Where were the NDP when we announced in Peel Region a Peel Order. Black Health and Social Services Hub? Nowhere. Nothing. They don't care. They don't talk about it because they see that we are Order. making the investments. We will continue to. No, Speaker. Earlier this morning, I had an opportunity to talk to over 600 providers who are working in community, in community health centres, doing the work that this member is frankly dismissing. And we will continue Opposition to make those investments because we see when we work with people, when we work with communities, when we Response. make those investments, 
That's when you see a difference, not when the NDP members spew facts that, frankly, have no reality. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor to come to. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, it's always a great day when Percy Hatfield is in our presence, so welcome. So, Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, or as I dub him, the Minister for Green Automotive Production, Windsor Essex. Here, here. So the carbon tax is hurting businesses and families back home and right across the province. And as the Premier has repeatedly said, it is truly the worst tax. It is an inflationary tax that penalizes the hardworking men and women who are the backbone of our economy. So and Ontario is home to a wealth of skilled workers in key sectors that will be vital to the province's economic success and prosperity in the years to come. The last thing a government should be doing is hiking taxes on workers and chasing them away. Question. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please explain what he is hearing from companies and workers about the carbon tax? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we just returned from the Bio International Convention to promote Ontario's thriving life sciences ecosystem. And we talked about um, companies around the globe, and they're intrigued by how rapidly Ontario life science is continuing to grow. Ontario has the best talent pool, with over 70,000 STEM grads annually coming out of our renowned post-secondary institutions. And we want those workers to stay here in Ontario and succeed, which is why we've taken action to lower taxes so they can keep more of what they earn. But with the Liberal carbon tax, the federal government is moving in the opposite direction. They're making life less affordable and risking the progress that we have made, Speaker. We need Spons. them to come around, follow our lead, scrap, scrap the carbon tax today. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Truly, the people of Ontario want a government who will stand up for them here, here. and work to make their life more affordable not more expensive. And they had a clear choice in the by-elections in Milton and Lambton, Kent, oh, Middlesex. Yes, and certainly knocking on those doors, I received that message loud and clear. And they could vote for our government, who will always have their backs and fight to keep costs down, or they could vote for the Liberals and NDP, who endorsed the carbon tax and will never stand up to their federal cousins in Ottawa. Sounds like a bad idea. So it's no shock that they chose to elect two excellent new PC MPPs who are already, already important members of our government as we fight against unnecessary Liberal tax hikes. So, Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on why Liberals need to scrap their carbon tax? Oh, great question. Very good. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, when businesses are choosing where to invest and expand, they look for jurisdictions with lower costs. That's why, under the previous Liberal government, we saw businesses looking outside of Ontario. The Liberals put up mountains of red tape. They hiked tax after tax after tax, and they scared businesses away. 300,000 manufacturing jobs fled the province, and key industries were on the brink of collapse. And now the federal Liberals are trying to do this all over again with their carbon tax. We need the Liberals to reverse course. Speaker, we ask them, listen to the hard-working people and businesses in Ontario. Scrap the carbon tax today. Thank you. The next question, the member from London North Centre. Speaker, when people have the courage to reach out for mental health help, there must be someone there to listen and guide them to proper services. When Amanda called the 24-7 hotline, and despite the receptionist exclaiming, wow, that's a lot, there was no one Amanda could talk to in that moment. Children's mental health wait lists are years long. Students aren't getting any mental health supports in schools, and there are just so many other areas where this government can't get their act together. Why is this government underfunding CMHA and disregarding their wise funding requests in Budget 2024? 
the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm not aware of there being uh, issues with respect to funding CMHA. As a matter of fact, we spend a great deal of money working with CMHA to provide the great services they do throughout the province of Ontario. In fact, we partner up with them in many of the services that are being provided, whether it's the mobile crisis and, uh, response teams, whether it's providing the supports and services in our children and youth sector, whether it's in the youth wellness hubs, whether it's their centres where they're dealing with crisis, whether it's in the crisis centres that they're operating for us throughout the centre. We are investing, and this government continues to invest in building a continuum of care that's based in the community, in all the communities, so that the supports and services are provided close to home to individuals. Now, the government has made incredible investments, over $500 million a year, to build this system, and it's continuing to build the system, notwithstanding the neglect of the past government supported by the NDP. The Fonts. government is making investments in creating that continuum of care, and it is making a real difference thanks to the partnerships. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Speaker, the minister says this government is building, and we are here to say that this government needs to build faster. It seems to me that there's more interest from this government in billion-dollar bucket beer, while London's mobile crisis response, the COAST program, is not funded at all by this government. Mental health funding isn't making it to people when and where they need it. People like Amanda deserve to get supports in times of need. When will this government admit they're failing when it comes to addressing the mental health needs of Ontarians? Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'm uh, surprised that that would be a comment coming that we're failing. If you look at what we inherited from the past government and the investments that we're making, building a system that did not exist in the past, one, you one of the things you should be saying is the accolades that we should be getting for the work that we're doing. To build a system, you don't do it overnight. And the investments that are, we're making are sizable, given the fact that we are making significant changes throughout the system, not just in providing the supports and services that are desperately needed throughout the province, but also trying to reduce the demand and the needs for those services by investing in innovation like youth wellness hubs, 27 of them to be exact throughout the province of Ontario. Making upstream investments will ensure that in the future, the services that are being developed today are going to be sized to the needs of the province. That's what this government is doing. It's focused and will continue to build a system of care for everyone in the province. Thank you. Next question, the member for Orleans. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is for the, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, over the years, I've received numerous emails, phone calls, and letters about the state of our education system. Recently, Catholic teachers reached out to articulate concerns about the teacher shortage, the billions in repair backlog, and the lack of per pupil funding. But, Mr. Speaker, what I've rarely been asked about is greater access to the sale of beer and wine. Now, I don't mind selling beer and wine at the corner store, but as a fiscal conservative, I do mind the billion dollar price tag that comes along with it. I wonder, I wonder, Mr. Speaker, how this government is going to make up the billion dollar shortfall, already having ballooned the provincial debt by nearly $100 billion. Taking on more debt is not a fiscally responsible approach. So, Mr. Qu Mr. Speaker, my question to avoid taking on massive amounts question. of new debt, why won't this government auction licenses to sell alcohol and beer like Conservative governments in Alberta and Saskatchewan and use that money to better fund our education system? The Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, what the member opposite is really saying is what their party would do is they would increase the taxes and the fees on the consumers and the small businesses of Ontario. Is that the right thing to do? I don't think so, Mr. Speaker. And you know, you know what this is about. We heard from people. We heard from businesses. They want to stimulate uh, the economic activity of Ontario. The Convenience Association said this will create thousands of jobs. You know, the grape growers, the wine growers, the uh, craft brewers, the cideries across Ontario. This is good for Ontario. I don't know what the member opposite has against Ontario businesses, Mr. Speaker. I don't know why the member opposite Order. would want to increase 
fees Order. and taxes. This is a government that cuts fees and taxes. Now, we'll update the, the numbers this fall, for sure. But I may remind the member opposite. Order. This, this, this member's party also increased the debt to the highest subnational debt in the world. Mr. Speaker, their government got downgraded. Order. The next supplementary question. Back to the member. Mr. Speaker, with $100 billion added to the debt, it is still the highest subnational debt in the world under this Conservative government. So much so, Mr. Speaker, I actually think he's applying to run for Justin Trudeau in the next election, not Mr. Poliver. This government is so fixated on beer and wine and booze that health care is an afterthought, Mr. Speaker. How can they justify two million Ontarians going without a family doctor? Imagine, Mr. Speaker, every resident of the combined cities of Ottawa, Windsor, London, Kingston and Guelph no family doctor, Mr. Speaker. With a price tag of a billion dollars, is Order. the price tag of a billion dollars really worth the opportunity to go buy a six-pack at the corner store? Is that really what's going to solve our problems, Mr. Speaker? How about a billion dollars to reduce the surgical backlog that a quarter million on Question. are facing? Auctioning the licenses like true Conservative governments in Alberta and, and Saskatchewan have done would raise hundreds of millions of dollars. Money that could be invested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, did that member opposite vote for or against cutting the gas tax? Against. Mr. Speaker, did that member opposite and their party vote for or against the budget? Against. But one thing they did do when they were in power, they got downgraded by the credit rating agency DBRS, Mr. Speaker. And guess which government? has a positive credit watch, not just from DBRS, not just from Moody's, but also S&P. It's this government that's lowering the borrowing costs for the people of Ontario. In fact, in fact that's reversing the trend. It took 15 years to bury this province, Mr. Speaker. It's taken us six short years to turn the economy around. As my member, uh, a colleague here says, 300,000 taillights leaving Ontario. Fonts. 700,000 headlights bringing jobs back in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This just never occurred to the member opposite that you can be fiscally responsible and grow the economy. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Sport and Culture. The Liberal carbon tax is driving up the cost of everyday essentials and making life unaffordable for Ontarians. With summer fast approaching, many families are looking forward to taking some time off and exploring our province with their loved ones. But the carbon tax continues to wreak havoc on our economy, including our cherished and world-class tourism sector. Speaker, just last week, Bonnie Crombie's federal cousins suggested that the cost of a family road trip is akin to letting the plant burn. It is shocking to hear how out of touch the Liberals are with Ontario families. Question. Speaker, could the minister please tell the House how the federal Liberal carbon tax is impacting summer plans for Ontarians? Yes. Parliamentary assistant member for Niagara West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for his leadership on ensuring that we have a strong tourism sector here in the province of Ontario. But I have to tell you, Speaker, when I heard that the Liberal members of Parliament were saying that people shouldn't be going on road trips this summer, my jaw hit the floor. And I'll tell you right now, when we talk to the people of Ontario, we know that they want to get out there and they want to hit the road. But I'm thinking that right now, the federal Liberals should be hitting the road too because, you know, when you look at the fact that we have a long tradition here in Ontario of people being able to get out and enjoy small towns and big cities across this province, whether you're going up to Kenora, whether you're stopping by Lanark County, whether you're visiting Kingsville, uh, we know that the people of Ontario have the right to be able to enjoy those opportunities. And we, unlike the federal Liberals, believe in the rights of the people of Ontario to go out, enjoy a road trip and ensure that they're spending Response. a little bit of money on the road as well to support our local businesses. Businesses. So we're going to continue to cut costs for those families and encourage them to be able to get out, make a road trip, come down to Niagara. We'd love to have you. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for the response. The liberal carbon tax is hurting people in my riding of Mississauga and Mills and across Ontario. It is driving up inflation and increasing the cost of everything. Speaker, it's perplexing how the Liberals and NDB can ignore the heavy burden the carbon tax puts on families. <coughs> Every day we hear more about how people are struggling with the increasing cost of basic, basic necessities. Parents taking their kids to hockey practice or on a road trip are now paying more at the gas pump. <coughs> That's not right. Ontarians deserve, deserve to enjoy the summer season with their loved ones and explore our province without worrying about extra costs. Question. Speaker, could the parliamentary assistant please explain to the House what our government is doing to get the people on the road and support summer tourism? Member for Niagara West. Well, thank you, and I think that the member opposite really spoke very eloquently about uh, the benefits of the people of Ontario getting out and enjoying some of the incredible sights and attractions that this province has to offer. And we know that, unlike the federal government, our government is not penalizing those who want to have a summer vacation, who want to spend a few days on the road. We're actually encouraging that. We're encouraging those people who have the opportunity to get out and visit small towns, spend a few bucks on a nice meal, uh, take their family out for a visit to the beach, maybe a visit to one of the sights and sounds and small businesses that make up this beautiful province. And so what we've done is taken a different approach. We've cut the gas tax. We've actually cut the gas tax. We've cut license plate sticker fees because we know that the majority of the people of this province are drivers and we want to encourage them to be able to enjoy every single corner of this province. And it's not only that, it's what the millions Response. of dollars that we've devoted to the Experience Ontario program, the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, our sport hosting program. In so many ways, we are ensuring that the people of this province have the opportunity to enjoy every square inch of this beautiful province and we'll continue. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickelhead. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre. Thank you. I have a question for the health minister. From Thunder Bay to Kingston and all across our province have come to Queen's Park to share with us, legislators, the challenges they are facing on the front line of emergency care here in Ontario. All political parties are sending representatives but a month after the invitations were sent, only one representative from Mr. Ford's government is confirmed to attend. Will the minister accept the paramedics' invitation and join them any time between 1 and 3 this afternoon right here at Queen's Park? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I hope as you do the roundtable with the paramedics, um, you are able to highlight some of the incredible investments that we've been able to do working with our community paramedicine. Order. You know, when we Order. did 911 models of care where we ensured that patients voluntarily can be diverted to other places to get service in community, Order. it was actually working directly with paramedics and paramedic organizations. Uh, when we do the nurse, uh, the dedicated uh, nurse offload program, embedding individuals paid 100% by the province of Ontario to ensure that paramedics could get back out into community faster. It was as a result of conversations that we have had with paramedics and their um, organizations. Response. We'll continue to listen and respond to their input. We have done that since 2018, and I have to say that paramedics have stepped up every step of the way to ensure. Thank that. you. Supplementary question. Well, the paramedics have set a, quite a straightforward agenda. Uh, these frontline workers want to talk to us about mental health challenges that they face, the education barriers uh, with the preceptorship. They want to talk about practice standards and, of course, staffing. The paramedics are not just bringing concern speaker uh, from the front line. They have solutions to offer. They need the ears of decision maker like yourself, like the minister, like your parliamentary assistant, like your ADM for emergency services, who were all invited to attend. Minister, paramedics wants to know, will you come today and listen to the concern of the people who answer the call and help us often on the worst day of our life. Mr. Hell. 
Perhaps the member opposite has not been paying attention as we invest and increase Order. paramedic uh, opportunities for training in Northern Ontario, Order. expanding them, including them, into the Learn and Stay program, where yep. their tuition and books are covered as they agree to practice and continue their service in parts of the province that are underserviced. You know, we have done a lot of work with community paramedicine. I have seen firsthand how it impacts our communities, particularly our seniors who are staying at home and, are, have, and have more confidence because they have that community paramedicine program. We'll continue to do this work. We'll continue to invest. Of course, we are a 50-50 percent partner with our municipal partners Spons. on paramedic services, and we will continue to do that. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I had a billion dollars, if I had a billion dollars, well, I'd buy you a Order. house. I would buy you a fourplex in this housing crisis. Order. And if I had a billion dollars, if I had a billion dollars, I'd buy equipment for your house, maybe a nice heat pump with a rebate. But seriously, Mr. Speaker, how can this government think, possibly think, getting booze in convenience stores one year early would be a priority for Ontarians in an affordability crisis, in a housing crisis, in a health care crisis, in a climate emergency? Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier, question. are you that nervous about the next election the other resources do? Mr. Finance. A lot to work with there. Get her a Juno. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, through you, thank you uh, for the question from the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. Uh, colleagues, you know why we're here? It's her party that signed one of the worst contracts in the history of the province, a 10-year monopoly, order. a 10-year bad contract. Ottawa the South come to order. The members uh, are agreeing with that, Mr. Speaker. You know, let's, let's take a look at uh, what this is going to do for our economy, because clearly the economy is paramount on this side of the House. Economic prosperity, good jobs for people. You know, the study from the Convenience Industry Council of Canada projects 7,000 to 7,500 jo new jobs in Ontario and 165 million to invest in convenience stores. Response. The study also estimates up to $213 million in new annual tax revenues, 69% of which will go to the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, well, if this government is looking for areas to spend From money, I have order. a good list for things in Beaches East York. A new Secord Public School, which I talked about to you last week. They've been waiting forever. Funding for Michael Guerin's redevelopment. Hospitals Ooh. aren't that important these days, are they? Cooling systems for our school with extreme heat upon us. Government side, Operational costs for TDC. Family doctors for everyone. More affordable housing, especially assisted living. If I had a billion dollars, I would invest in Ontario. Yes! My question to you, for you, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, why are you spending a billion dollars on booze? Why are your priorities so skewed? Yeah. Minister of Finance. I'm going to correct the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. We're not spending $1 billion. We're spending $200 billion on health care, on education, on social services. I'm going to correct the member opposite. We're investing $190 billion on capital over the next 10 years to build hospitals, to build schools, to build long-term care, to build highways, to build transit. Mr. Speaker, no government has ever spent that kind of money to invest. You know why? Because we are investing in the future. We're making up for the time that the previous Liberal government didn't get it done. Mr. Speaker, this government has the priorities of the people of Ontario. We're building the economy, we're building the infrastructure, and we're supporting the workers in this great province to get it done. 
And the next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. All Ontarians deserve to find a home that best meets their needs and budget. Speaker, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, failed to plan ahead for the future needs of Ontarians. And now the provincial Liberals are supporting a tax that is only pushing Ontario families further away from their dream of home ownership. This is simply unacceptable, Speaker. Our government, under the Premier Leader, under leadership of Premier Ford, remains laser-focused on getting more homes built faster and helping more Ontarians find affordable housing. And we are doing it as we continue to fight against the costly carbon tax. Speaker, can the Associate Minister tell the House how our government is working to build the homes Ontario families need despite the federal carbon tax? Great question. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, to the member from Oakville. Uh, always good to hear from him. Our housing crisis is only made worse, Speaker, because of the federal carbon tax. And this government has delivered to offset it, Speaker. We delivered $1 billion in the last budget, provincial budget, wow. to enable housing. That's a lot. We delivered $1.2 billion of the Building Faster Fund and are seeing tangible results. We delivered the elimination of the HST on purpose built rentals, and we delivered unprecedented reductions in red tape to make shovels in the ground happen faster. Speaker, Speaker, we are supporting community home builders. Unlike the carbon tax coalition opposite, led by Bonnie Crombie, Speaker, Speaker, they are not supporting community home builders, and frankly, Speaker, they are taxing the dream of home ownership out of the reach of all Canadians. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. Young families should not have to struggle to pay for a down payment. Seniors on fixed incomes should not have to worry about being displaced. Speaker, everyone in Ontario deserves to have a place to live Order. that meets their needs and their budget, and the Liberals are making it more and more unaffordable by supporting that carbon tax. It is essential for all governments to provide real solutions in addressing the housing and affordability crisis. Unfortunately, our government is fighting this battle alone. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain why the Liberals and NDP must join us in calling for an end to the carbon tax and making housing more affordable again? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, as we all know, the federal carbon tax has always been a burden for Canadian home builders. It's inflationary and it's punitive. In fact, the Bank of Governor, uh, the Bank of Canada Governor, last year stated that of total inflation, the carbon tax contributed 16 percent. Wow. That means higher interest rates for families, higher mortgage rates, and it also means higher capital costs, Speaker, for community home builders. It means all costs related to building a house go up. It's wrong, and what makes it worse is the compounding nature of this carbon tax. Its cost of living is hurting all Ontarians and hurting Canadians. Speaker, if the federal government really wants to help Ontarians, I think the Carbon Tax Coalition next door should understand that the carbon tax in this province is wrong, and most importantly, Speaker, Bonnie Crombie and the coalition is wrong Response. on housing, wrong on the carbon tax, and frankly, wrong for all Ontarians. Next question, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Financial Accountability Office released a report this morning which projects the Ministry of Children and Community Services has allocated $3.7 billion dollars less than what was needed in program spending from 2024 to 2026-27. The ministry is responsible for everything from funding, developmental services, child protection, Ontario Works, ODSP payments, and the autism funding, and much more. All of the programs which are required to serve and support vulnerable Ontarians. Can the minister explain why there is a $3.7 billion shortfall. Uh, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank my uh, colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, as I've said it many times here in this House, the FAO opinions 
uh, are not representatives of actual government spending as the FAO uses different methodology. Order. Mr. Speaker, I'd be more than happy to share some facts and some numbers with my colleagues across. Mr. Speaker, the funding for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services increased by $600 million this year, Mr. Speaker. Last year, the funding for this ministry increased by $900 million, Mr. Speaker. The year before that, Mr. Speaker, the funding for the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services increased by $1.2 billion, Mr. Speaker. So I'll be more than happy to share some facts. My, my honourable colleagues talk about developmental services, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that is providing Spons. more than $1 billion with developmental services across the system, something the previous government didn't do that the NDP supported along the way. When we say we're not going to leave anyone behind, Mr. Speaker, that Thank you. Supplementary question. I will take the financial accountabilities officer's word over, I will, over this ministry any day. Speaker, $3.7 billion is a huge shortfall for programs that literally keep some of Ontario's most vulnerable populations alive. The FAO projects that $120 million announced this year in autism funding is one-time funding, and then that budget will continue uh, to be $600 million year over year. That would only be enough to enroll 10,000 kids in core clinical services, not even close to the 20,000 that the minister's binder suggests, with 60,000 and growing awaiting for autism services, does the minister think that this is going to be enough? Question. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank my honourable colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the Ontario Autism Program, I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Speaker. After the previous government, supported by the NDP, failed the people of this yeah. province, Order. it was this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, that said, we're not going to stand, stand with the status quo. The, this program that we have in place now, Mr. Speaker, is built by the community for the community. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to funding, Order. the member struggles and for Hamilton Mountain comes more often, quite, often, quite. We've seen that before, Mr. Speaker. We doubled the funding of the Ontario Autism Program. We added that another $60 million to the program, and this year, Mr. Speaker, we added $120 million to the $600 million, bringing our total to $720 million. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? Instead of the 8,500 families who Response. were receiving services and supports before, now more than 40,000 families are receiving supports and services. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peter Baltimore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Great minister. The Liberal carbon tax is harmful to every single person in this province. That's right. It does nothing for the environment, and it only punishes the people of Ontario with higher costs for daily necessities. You can't afford Bonnie Crombie. Families in the North are especially affected by this regressive tax, as they already pay more for groceries and for fuel. Speaker, the opposition NDP and the independent Liberals have an opportunity to advocate on behalf of the residents of Northern Ontario, but rather than joining with our government and calling on the federal Liberals to terminate the carbon tax, they prefer to sit in their seats and watch this tax increase time and time again. That is not what the people of Ontario want or deserve. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House why Northern communities cannot afford the federal carbon tax? Good question. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Here's the thing, Mr. Speaker. It's summertime. I know I can't get, wait to get back to Lake of the Woods, but with Beautiful over 500 place. seasonal lodges, outfitting camps, and campgrounds, of which I know there are quite a few in the members, as he likes to say, uh, God's country, uh, Peterborough, Kawarthas, uh, families are going to make some tough choices. I was talking to one of my neighbors the other day, and I said, now, where are you going to take that big trailer this year, every summer, he just kind of spins the campground wheel and takes his family somewhere in another part of northern Ontario. He said, this year, you know where he's going, colleagues? Where? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Camp backyard. Wow. Yeah. It's a campground in his backyard. He's just going to open the trailer there because he can't afford to hitch that thing up to his pickup truck and go and spend some money in another part of northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, clearly, outfitters, lodge owners, 
campground owners and families thou in the thousands who just want to explore Response. our vast and beautiful region are saying one thing, Mr. Speaker, scrap the tax. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. While the Liberal members in this legislature believe that Ontario stands to benefit from more taxes, the reality couldn't be more different. Residents in the North who already struggle to pay their bills are now being forced to pay more for food and for fuel. And with the weather warming up, it's just not fair that families have to cancel their summer plans because they're stretched at the pocketbook. Speaker, Ontarians need more relief, not a 23% tax hike here, here. on the carbon tax. You can't afford the that. federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts need to do the right thing and get rid of the carbon tax immediately. Do Speaker, the right can the minister thing. please elaborate on why the Liberals need to scrap their carbon tax? <laughs> minister of Northern Development and Let Development, I should say. Hold on. You got Go ahead. Okay. Well, let's start here, Mr. Speaker. When seven out of 10 Canadians oppose the carbon tax from myriad polls, Mr. Speaker, when the parliamentary budget officer says, not so fast, king of the carbon tax, and he says, this is gonna cost families up to $1,000 more, and this message through you to Mr. Green, because it's time to come clean, uh -huh. Mr. Speaker, after the rebate, which he loves so much, we got a problem here, Mr. Speaker, and all I can tell you is that the carbon tax royalty, Mr. Speaker, is beginning to abdicate their throne, except for one exception. The queen of the carbon tax chooses to be a Badinsky, Mr. Speaker. Not only is she interested in keeping the carbon tax alive, she has a history of raising other taxes, Mr. Speaker. Listen to the voice of seven out of ten Canadians and the parliamentary budget officer, if no one else, Mr. Speaker, and scrap this here, tax. Here, here, here. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.